friendship. So we must push one common intention. It's for a better life in the region. For the woman and we children. That must be the ambition of the Caribbean and the Caribbean and the Caribbean. And welcome to this evening's edition of Politics 101 on a Monday evening. Then, of course, it's our podcast this evening, Open Word Podcast. Our regular guest, uh, Professor Clive Thomas, and we are going to be looking at all things economics, or at least starting there, because economics is linked to politics, it's linked to culture, it links to everything else. Um, that we deal with. Uh, welcome to all of you to Politics 101. If you're joining us from Guyana, welcome. Those of you who are joining us from the wider Caribbean, welcome, welcome to you. Antigua, those of you from Antigua and Barbuda, St. Kitts and Nevis. There are lots of cricket going on in St. Kitts. The CPL is stopping there in St. Kitts. I don't think they're getting over to Nevis, but I know quite a few Guyanese are over there in Nevis. Uh, hope you're enjoying the cricket. Uh, I know the Amazon Warriors won their first game, and uh, that should bring some joy to the hearts of Guyanese there. Um, those of you who are joining us from Barbados, uh, I, I think the CPL is going to stop there shortly and then uh, to Trinidad, and then on to Guyana. Welcome to Politics 101. How about those of you who are joining us from uh, the United States of America, Canada? Um, a special shout out to the people in Texas. I know quite a few people from Texas join us on uh, this uh, program. Um, people in Washington, D.C., Maryland, Virginia area, a uh, special hello to you. How about those of you who are joining us from Arizona, where, where I am, where I am, and I know, I know I don't always remember the Arizonians, and some of you out there in California, welcome to Politics 101. We're not forgetting you in Europe especially those of you who join us from the United Kingdom and France. Welcome to our Politics 101. A special shout out to Mr. Trotman from Buxton, who um, joins us sometimes from France. A special welcome to you. And uh, no, I have not forgotten those of you who are joining us from Suriname and French Guyana. Welcome. Welcome to Politics 101, a brand new week. And we start off the week with the economy. Sugar, sugar, King Sugar. Used to be. We are now in the era of oil. I don't know if they call it King Oil, but they do call it the Black Gold. Uh, but King Sugar. Sugar and our Caribbean have been twins, if you will. Um, one cannot separate sugar from slavery. One cannot separate sugar from indentureship. One cannot separate sugar from the Caribbean. One cannot separate sugar from the rise of capitalism in Western Europe. Sugar, sugar, sugar. Well, Guyana has been one of the few places in the English-speaking Caribbean that is on hand to sugar. Uh, we are monoculture economies. We depend mostly on one product. And some of the English-speaking Caribbean countries have diversified out of sugar. Places like Jamaica diversified out of sugar. Um, you know, bauxite, banana, and tourism. Uh, uh, you know, only recently St. Kitts. We were talking about St. Kitts the other day. I remember covering St. Kitts a couple of decades ago. About that time, as uh, St. Kitts and Nevis were diversifying out of sugar. Um, and, and, and the simple fact is that uh, 
our 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 economies have been subsidizing sugar because you know the price of sugar on the world market is not what it used to be and uh, the amount of money we pay to produce the sugar is really not uh, making it um uh, competitive uh, economically um it doesn't make economic sense and we in guyana we have held on to sugar we have held on to sugar for political reasons <clears throat> because as you know sugar workers are part of the base of one of the major political parties the ppp and they are more concerned about uh, maintaining political control rather than uh, um, making the economy uh, a viable economy. We are seeing that with oil and gas. Th they're less concerned with development and more concerned about using the proceeds from oil and gas to maintain themselves in power. And it's the same thing with sugar, the same thing with sugar. And we have had this debate about sugar and sugar. And you remember when the coalition government came to power, they took the bull by the horns, if you will. And they decided that they were going to do something finally about sugar. And they came up with the idea of right-sizing the sugar industry. Uh, they set up a commission of inquiry and the commission advised them on how they should go about dealing with the sugar industry. Um, well, politics, politics, politics. And as we have titled our program today, The Politics and Economics of Sugar in Guyana. And sugar has been in the news again recently. One, the government went back, as you remember, a couple of weeks ago and asked for more money. Asked for more money. Uh, and and I think 1.8 1.8 billion. I can't remember the exact money, the exact uh, amount now, but quite a, a, a bit of that was to pour in to the sugar industry, pour into Gaisuku. And then we had the bizarre development, um, only recently, of the reopening of the Rosal sugar estate, and the attempt to transfer workers from Blemont and Albion back to Rosal. Now, I say back because these are workers who were transferred from Rosal when the estate was closed under the coalition. And they went to Blemont and some went to Albion. Now they're opening Rosal and they are asking the workers to, in a sense, retransfer. Um, if there is such a term, uh, to um, to uh, uh, Rosal. And the sugar workers have said, well, first of all, you have to pay them severance. Uh, and, and then after you pay them severance, then they'll decide whether they'll go back to Rosal. Uh, now, the story, I think, is linked so when Rosal Estate was closed, some workers opted out, and so they were paid their severance, and then they were given two hundred and fifty thousand um, dollars when they call it, when the PPP came into power. And those who were transferred obviously were not given severance because they did not sever the ties with um, Gaisuko. So, um, as the Trinidadians would say, bacchanal. Uh, they were picketing the PPP office in New Amsterdam. The union got into it saying they're supporting the workers. And I think the latest is that Gaisuko has removed the um, transfer from the table. I think that's the latest. So as usual when these things happen, if you're coming at them in the present, you really don't have... A, a, a clear sense of what is going on. Because like everything else, these things have a history, a history. So who better to walk us through um, this than Clive Thomas, Professor Clive Thomas. Um, he has been studying and writing on sugar for as long as I know. I always tell the story 
um, that when I was a, a boy in the 70s and first taken an interest in politics and the WPA would come to Buxton to all meetings and there were all these speakers, Clive Thomas, Rupert Rupnarain, Takumo Gunsi, Walter Rodney, Kwayana Moses, Bagwan, etc., and Daye Bonita Harris. And I remember we young people used to be excited when um, Walter Rodney was coming. He was the new kid in tongue and the new revolutionaries. But the older people, the older men, especially the farmers, they used to be excited when Clive Thomas was coming. And we couldn't understand why, you, you, you know, Thomas was talking economics and, and, and so on. We know that, but we couldn't understand the linkage until much later on, um, as, uh, you know, I became an activist and you began to talk with people. And they, the older men, the farmers would tell you, Clive Thomas was talking their language to code them because they were farmers. A lot of them were doing what was called farmer cane. They were planting cane at the back of the village and selling to the estate. So when Thomas come and he was talking about sugar, that was there, that was right up their alley. So I'm saying that to say how long Clive Thomas has been, has been dealing with sugar. And uh, when the coalition came into power, he was named as chairman of the board of Kaisuku. And so again, he was plunged now, not just into writing, and theorizing about sugar, but really to practically help to um, guide the sugar industry at that critical period. So uh, Thomas is well placed to speak on sugar, the economic and politics of sugar then and now. Let's bring in Professor Clive Thomas. Professor Thomas, uh, good evening. Good evening, David. And I, I think I, I, I may have taken you back in time when I talk about the 70s, when you would come into the villages. And, I'm accustomed um, to that, David. <laughs> you're accustomed <laughs> to it now after being here so long. But, but, but tell, tell us, how your, as I understand it, your PhD, your economics, your area in economics had to do with finance, right? Yes, money and finance and the dependent economy. Right. How did you make the transition? I think the answer is obvious because you would have uh, had your PhD in the 1960s at the time you're becoming independent and um, all of that stuff. But, but, but how, do you, how did you pivot from finance to things like sugar? Well, I suppose at the time there were so many areas of economic development and theory that were unexplored that just the natural evolution of scholarship. You know, we go from topic to topic, and then we were scarce in terms of having the amount of um, people power to do all the research. So sometimes you had to fill in, and that led me to do a lot, a lot of research in almost every area of Caribbean life. Yes, and that's what I was getting at, is the Caribbean life, because uh, um, the 60s, we are becoming independent, and almost all the English speaking Caribbean country that's something to do with sugar. Even places like Jamaica, which had begun to diversify out of sugar, um, sugar still was a big cloud um, and a big influence on the economies of the Anglophone Caribbean. Yes? Yes, and research institutions um, also supported us. I can remember the IDRC in Canada supported us and we did what is called a pioneering study, never been done before and still hasn't um, been um, replicated. And that was concerned with trying to use sugar as a chemical feedstock. And we are celebrated as being the um, source of that study. Uh, celebrated as being the source yeah. of that study. And, it's and called sh sugar threat or challenge. Uh -huh. The industry is being challenged, being threatened, and the challenge was to convert sugar into something else. And most people don't know, but sugar can be made into any chemical or not. That now we use the black gold of oil and gas to make. So, in a sense, we hadn't really left where we are now 
in investigating oil as a source of energy and chemicals because sugar, because they can break it down into alcohol. And that's a primary chemical uh -huh. that can make any product or not from lipstick to bombs. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Professor, let me uh, let me take you. Um, uh, 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 let me stay back in time because you were one of the leaders of an organization called Ratoon yeah. at the <laughs> University of Guyana. And of course, yeah, Ratoon yeah. had to do with sugarcane. Talk to us yeah. about that. Well, we as radical individuals at the time had to find a name for um, the group. And I had suggested Ratoon largely because it was working on sugar at the time. It wasn't a, maybe the best name because Ratoons are limited in number in the sense that they, if after four or five Ratoons, you really don't want to do it again. You find new lands, you rest the land. But, but what we were trying to suggest is that we had a way of rebirth and re-energizing that we did not and could not be removed from contributing by any attack on one or all of us that they would all be reborn because the report was sourced in the ideas we were generating so we wanted to carry that notion of um regeneration going forward so that the growth of consciousness the growth of political Awareness became a part of the life of the intellectual classes of Guyana. That's the legacy we wanted to leave. Professor Clive Thomas here reflecting on the linkage of sugar to the larger institutions and the larger history of our Caribbean, especially the Anglophone Caribbean. It's not really <coughs> confined to the Anglophone Caribbean because sugar um, in places like the Dominican Republic and, 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 and the other Caribbean islands, um, sugar was very much part. But, uh, Professor, at some point, um, Caribbean countries <coughs> began to diversify out of sugar. Why? Well, because um, of opportunities and a recognition that sugar was not, did not have a long-term international future too many competitive items were being found for sugar including non non caloric sugar sweeteners it started out with suckling as you do to almost every you know, to many other types of non caloric sweeteners like um splendor and so forth so that once that happened people could find a way of taking sweets or sweetening products without getting calories, they would up for that. So I think that's a long run global trend. So sugar would be important in some industries, bakery goods and things like that. But ultimately, if people wanted to consume sugar, they don't want to consume the calories associated with sugar. And they're always looking for ways in which to um, reduce that. So the competition from non non caloric sweetness has been the source, I think, of the fundamental destruction of sugar as a commodity. Uh, and that, and that, is, well, that is why we search for chemicals. Because sugar is a is has an alcohol base. So if you convert it into alcohol, you can make any chemical. So we tried to see if there were ways in which we could uh, make sugar. A chemical that could be um, used for other commercial purposes, making household goods that we need, or even making petrol and things like that, as you heard, or you know of in Brazil. Yes. Um, yeah. yeah. The, the, uh, all of this would have affected the price of sugar on the world market. Yeah, yes. yeah, it would, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, the largest producers have been producers who had an enormous amount of lands. Because in the early days, sugar was a specialty product. People couldn't afford or find sweeteners everywhere. So the growing of sugar was a really a profitable enterprise. 
through profitability made many countries like Britain and France and lots of parts of Europe major empires coming out of this sweetening power of people because people wanted it and they still do want it but they don't want the calories associated with it. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That is why the other types of products have grown to exceed sugar consumption. Uh -huh, uh -huh, uh -huh. Let's come to Guyana because we've been talking thus far about the economics of sugar. In, in Guyana, the economics of sugar is tied to the politics of sugar. Yeah. Um, uh, 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 explain that for us, if you will. Well, essentially, Guyana and the cultivation of sugar it's people intensive. It requires lots of labor. Even though it has significant machinery involved in like the factories and so forth, to squeeze the juice and to make the actual sugar. The primary cultivation of the of the um sugar sugar cane is driven to a large extent by the use of labor. So labor costs have become important. But in other areas of producing the sweetening element of sugar. You can use industrial methods because a tender doesn't require 25 or 30,000 people to produce, let's say, the equivalent of 100,000 tons. But in, but in Guyana, you'll have to do that. So it, it was easily outcompeted in the global markets. And that has always kept the price at a range where only the very, very low cost sugar producers can afford to produce sugar. And those low-cost producers have a lot of land. The land that they have can be easily mechanized so that they don't have to use a lot of labor relative to the land to be able to sustain the output of sugar. In Guyana, we don't have that opportunity. We don't have a lot of land, although we have a lot of land relative to the Caribbean. That's not considered much land globally. And moreover, we are below the sea level so all our estates are bounded by waterways, waterways everywhere, north, south, east, west. In fact, there's a hundred miles of waterway for every one mile of sugarcane cultivation to tell you how much the role of waterways play in trying to keep the land drained and irrigated so that we could cultivate the shade, the sugarcane. So we have all those overheads to look at. And therefore, when we come to producing the sugar, we're not cost competitive. But we have developed some specialty sugars like, um, as you know, demerara crystals and things like that. And for those people pay premium prices. So we had, in, as part of the work of the um, commission we spoke about, had moved in the direction of trying to elevate the type of production and commercialize the um, selling power of Ghana sugar because it's known as the premium sugar worldwide, the Marara crystals. We had a lot of plans at the time. We even had sources of financing and coming out of the commission that did not have to rely on the government. And that was really, we were conversing and meeting with a lot of auction houses who were interested in selling the equipment that we had in the show estate to, um, specialty formed in the Middle East and elsewhere, China, so forth, because they had um, special historical significance and therefore could supply a market internationally where a lot of money is paid for what we would call junk, things that we won't use, we think we just leave in the estate. So, but all those things we were undertaking. And the sugar, when you produce the sugar cane, the sugar element is a small proportion of the total mass in the sugar cane. So we are trying to convert the mass in the sugar cane into what we were negotiated with the form as briquettes, which could be used in, the, um, in Europe for winter heating and where we might sell it in the premium quality of being um, a friendly chemical and not like coal causing chemical emissions and so on, carbon emissions and things like that. So all those things we had in mind. Also the sales yeah. of sugar lands 
to yes, you, you 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 you've you've gone into the commission, but let's let's um backpedal for a minute. Um, when the coalition government came to power, and you were um asked to chair the board, and you decided the board decided that they were once and for all going to deal with this. Uh, um, yeah, issue of sugar and very big on the agenda was the extent to which the state was subsidizing the sugar industry and how that was being a drain on the rest of the economy. Speak to that issue, um, for us. Well, remember that time we did not have oil and gas, right? So revenue was very, very scarce. And clearly, we could not afford to continue subsidizing, nor should we, at the rational set of decision makers and subsidizing the sugar for sale in Europe. So the benefit of that sale really is going to the European consumer and not the Guyanese. It was clearly an un untenable situation for us. And we are taught that um, the minister was very supportive. We are taught that um, after having the commission, having agreed to the commission, and if we follow the lines of the commission, the government, the APNU would have supported the efforts we were setting about to turn around the industry. Um, because you can't turn around an industry that is centuries old in one or two years. You need five to ten years to do that. And we are embarked on the task in a very serious way. I don't even think that some of the initiatives that we took have been even still up to now being recognized or discussed. And because they are, they are all these stages of any transformation likely to generate frictions. We generated a lot of friction in the community supporting the PPP. The government felt that we should not do that because um, we were not a political power unto ourselves. Um, at that stage, I didn't feel I wanted to be there because I thought the commission had um, established the parameters of the program that we were supposed to be introducing and following the guided industry going forward. And once that took place, I realized the industry is going to be, to be left to suffer over the years to come. Because when the people got back in power, they will take what they're doing now, efforts to try to sustain their supporters because they will feel or might have felt that they did act was deliberately designed to undermine their supporters. But that was never the intention. And we have tried to deal up as fair as we could. That is why in that incident that you mentioned about the severance pay, every single person entitled to severance received it. And even though we were late in some of the payments, following court ruling, we paid interest on the late payments. So there was no issue at all at our part of ever trying to be trade a trade union membership of the of the guide circle. So that was paid in full. But then when the PVP came to power, I think the vice president promised to um give the show workers two hundred and fifty thousand dollars at seven speed. And that introduced a dimension of paying handouts to um, employees that Kaisugo was never party to, or could never be a party to, because the form, a commercial form, although a public commercial form, a public corporation, and they had no business in paying out handouts. And that is where the source of all the problems stem from. And, and uh, <laughs> Professor, the contentious issue about the closing of the estates and uh, um, the PPP says seven thousand workers. Um, Minister of um, Minister of Finance <laughs> under the APNU AFC government said it was more like four thousand workers. Whatever. The number, yeah, go ahead. Um, speak to us about that old dynamic of closing the estates and. And, and, and well, well to, if you're going to the industry is structural in the states, the production of the, and so that part of the industry is organized through estates. 
So if you go to reorganize industry, you have to reorganize its elements that those are their states. Some estates, but all their states varied in the cost of production and what they can contribute to any reorganization that we're going to have. Some might do a lot for producing bulk elements so that we could sell the briquettes. Some might be used for generating the production of high quality sugar, um, but like there were crystals which we could sell. Some might be used in a way in which we could use the farmlands to develop fish farming, which was going to be our single biggest alternative production on the lands used by sugar. And we, in fact, had in, entered into a contract with a, an American firm located in the southern part of the United States, largely Florida. And they had made several visits to us. And we were the process of negotiating a contract to develop fish farming on a national scale and international scale in Guyana. We had the markets also where we did some preliminary negotiations with for the sale of the fish farming products. Um, that would be largely through the restaurants and so on, the dealers and all that who lined up the production of the fish and the cutting the fish of preparation for export, all that was being negotiated. The commercial relations going through the American agricultural agencies, all that was being negotiated. I don't know what has happened to that, but I've seen nothing in the press. Yeah, yeah. And and and, and the number of workers um, that were affected with the closure of um, Rose Hall, I think Wales, uh, uh, is it 7,000 as the PPP saying, or more 4,000 something as the Minister Jordan? What, what, whatever our record shows is correct, because we never went in for false retention of record. We mm -hmm. would never do that. So I'm absolutely mm -hmm. confident in whatever data Gaisuko put out will be the correct data. I don't want to say offhand what it actually was because I don't recall. Right. Um, I'd have to study, study the um, files and all that. But there, there, there is some controversy over or, uh, whether, over the decision to close the estates. Um, what, what, what was the recommendation of the Commission of Inquiry? To close, to re reorganize. To reorganize. To, to right size, yeah. To right size. But not we, just... We, we, but, but once we begin to in, instrumentalize the right sizing, once you begin to see this fact, we got to close it, particularly in the West Coast. The authorities got panicky. Mm -hmm. And you felt you were creating a problem, a political problem that we had no authority to do. <laughs> but they themselves had agreed to set up the commission. We didn't invite them to do that. And on the basis of the commission, they made a recommendation. The commission yeah. set up, put, put forward a report. I contributed to the commission. I was part of the commission. So at that time, there was no discussion with me about being part of the Chairman of the board. I was surprised when I was asked, um, but took on the task, even though I was busy with other engagements at the time. Yeah. Let, let's fast forward. The PPP comes to power. It promises to reopen the estates. It took them three years before they've um, now reopened Rosal. Um, what's, what's, what, 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 what happened there? What's, what, what's happening there? Well, you see, what what I think they are trying to do is to minimize the cost to themselves. And as everybody who has been a trade unionist would say in these situations, you don't want to penalize any worker. So I would never take a position against the workers. Um, but the government has responsibilities that go beyond the workers, they have responsibilities to the nation. But the structural situation the PPP has is that this is, is the source, a major source of their um, constituency 
So they have to try to satisfy that by trying to satisfy the national constituency, constituency that they were elected to, to um, work for or to represent and not any section of the constituency. So they are the other horns of a dilemma. And I think that um, what they're trying to do is to find a way around it. And the unions are not making it easy for them. And I, I would take the position that um, if they can get more out of it, they should try to get more of it. But the danger that's also carry is that I have always had with the greatest dangers facing the all windfall all revenues is getting sucked into some form of subsidization in Ghana, which is irrational in character and really represents a total waste of the reserve and windfall revenue that we're getting. And one of them is to finance firms that cannot generate a profit in the long run. So we continue to pump and lose money daily, daily. And instead of surplus contributing to the diversification and development of Ghana, it's subsidizing sugar for European consumers and American consumers who can afford to pay for higher sugar, sugar prices if they were asked. I think it's madness, so we should not ever do that. That is why I would not support anything to do with the national oil refinery that the government tries to finance. Because that is the source of losing all the surplus revenue we're generating from oil and gas. That would be the single biggest, those would be the single biggest tragedies that we face going forward. We have to avoid them as we avoid any terror that lies before us. The biggest threat to the surpluses that we're getting now is wasteful expenditure on industries that are purely symbolic in nature and not commercial and profitable. So it is a, really a remarkable thing that we have to avoid at all costs getting trapped in that. Because once we do that and subsidize all prices and things like that, we are on a one-way step to losing everything that we've actually achieved so far. Because the worst outcome, Dutch disease, every single experience that we have had around the world, where people with, in the petrol states fail, is when the government uses the money to finance unsustainable activities, as we were talking about yesterday. Once the activities are not sustainable, they cannot finance themselves. They're not profitable as they are for themselves. You're going down a rabbit hole, and the dig for the more and more you dig into that hole, the worse it gets. You can't dig your way out of a hole. It's, 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 Once you dig in and you're in a hole, it gets deeper. Yeah, yeah. And Support Supporters of the government have been arguing that um, sugar is is sustainable. That that we can we can we can save the sugar industry um, by keeping the estates open. We don't have to close the estates. That the subsidy that we give to the sugar workers that we are going to get it back as the sugar workers partake in the economy and so on and so forth. What about that argument? Everybody in the world, whoever argue for subsidy, uses those same arguments. And everybody in the world who wants to promote efficiency, development, and positive experiences for the country would know that is pure nonsense. It's the road to perdition. It's very easy said, but very hard to do. You cannot afford, you have to make it a basic rule. We're not going to lose any surplus by getting involved in non-profitable and non-sustainable activities. If we don't make that a cardinal rule, we can lose all the, all the wealth that we're supposedly getting now. And the government has to be firm because it's their survival that is at stake, as well as those of us who are poor and left but nothing within the country.
there's always a promise that you can make it different, but you can't fight the economics. The price of sugar, we sold the market now with around 23, 24 cents. The production cost of sugar is clearly close to 50 cents per pound now. How you can ever make that profitable? You have to be living in some sort of dreamland and fooling yourself. I mean, we are sympathetic to the workers, but it's their own interest that dictates that we who know better should argue for them on better grounds. We don't want to give them subsidies for another two or three years, and then we got nothing left. And we have to abandon the subsidies to them and everything else. All that is gone for naught. Because the same thing has happened with the 250,000 they paid out. That 250,000 they paid out of how many thousands in the world? You're talking about a billion, half a billion dollars have gone there already. And it was not justified. Put it in more productive activities for the farmers. Things that might have been sustainable over the period. That is why we had them hired so many employees to, to deal with the diversification issues on the estates. Specialists, we had employed at Gaisugo only for that purpose. Professor, you mentioned at the beginning of the conversation that when uh, you were dealing with the right size in a stream of Gaisugo, we didn't have oil money then. And there were some plans that you um, you all were going to put in in place that you didn't get to put in place. Fast forward to 2023, you have a commission of inquiry. How would you how would you move to deal with the industry at this time? The first thing I do, I ask I ask the persons who are running it to read that commission report. Okay, they, they don't give me any evidence that they even are learning by the mistakes. Because even if you think the, the commission was a mistake, read it and see what they were advertising. Read the record and see what they were trying to attempt. There's nothing in the public that signals any consideration of what was happening in that period. Nothing at all. And I don't want to appear as an outside critic, you know, just bashing people. It's not fair to the industry even if the people might be deserving. But I would say study the report, study the actions that were already taken, do some evaluation of it, and then try to work and correct it and find, find some footing going forward. Give us a strategic approach that you intend to use other than try to continue producing sugar in the old way, under all the old conditions without change. Professor Clive Thomas here talking to us about sugar. Professor, what has been the experience in places like St. Kitts um, that um, recently, uh, relative recently, um, uh, diversified out of sugar? Well, I think uh, um, the two points I want to make here. One is, of course, that when we produce sugar, we sell at different prices. And the um, CARICOM price is significantly higher than the world market price. And our primary aim was to be the chief designated supplier for CARICOM sugar. But it um, is crude sugar or it is processed sugar. So our objective was to win that market. The Ghana will have a basis for sustaining a certain amount of sugar, crude sugar in the estate based on the CARICOM price rather than the world price because we knew we could not compete in the world price, no matter what we did. The second point which I want to make is that the CARICOM producers have come out in the industry because they find that tourism is a far better and far more easily created source of employment if we got out of sugar than we would have been able to do by the things I told you about, trying to find markets for sugarcane briquettes, trying to sell 
stuffing the estates by auction, creating a tourist sector or system or agencies or, or operations within Gaisuko. All those things that we were trying to do would take time. But it, but it, but the tourist industry had the attractions that could be put in place faster. You could have Airbnb if you don't have a uh, hotels constructed. You could try all those shortcut methods, but we didn't have the time to do some of the longer term things we, we were doing. The person who was trying to get in the brickets with us, a French investor, he went to, Sur to Suriname as well. So we had to make decisions quickly. And I was absolutely sure that the thought of selling green energy to Europe, I could see the marketing opportunities. So when somebody can throw a piece of fuel onto fire side in Europe, and if you could tell them that it's green, and that is not giving off emissions to um, poison the earth, and the extent to which you can do it, coal. I had a lot of properties to make it sell. And that is important. We have to be commercial. And you want to commercialize the product, and that was the opportunity to do so. Professor Clive Thomas. Professor Clive Thomas is talking about sugar, the future of the sugar industry in Guyana. Is it sustainable? Is it not sustainable? Professor, is there anything you want to say that I didn't ask you? No, you asked me a lot of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> and, as it, and as it happens, well, so frequently in Guyana, we have a blackout, so at any moment, <laughs> this television might close down on you. The computer may close down, yes. Uh, all right, Professor, thank you very much. I mean, we've gone for almost an hour. Um, thank you very much for coming through and dealing with this timely issue because sugar never goes the way it seems and never. Uh, remains in the news. Professor, thank you very much. Okay. And uh, thank you, our viewers, for staying with us, um, dealing with the question of sugar. As uh, I said, the sugar never goes away. And... Uh, this government is going to hold on to that dying industry for as long as it can because of politics. It doesn't make economic sense. And they feel that because they have this windfall from oil, then it is easier to subsidize. But oil wealth, like all wealth, it's not, it's not finite. It's not finite. As, as we've been saying over and over again, that we have a, a small window by 2050. Um, we may have to diversify out of oil. And so therefore, given the, um, the deep nature of poverty, the challenges that an economy like Guyana brought from centuries of slavery and colonialism, uh, the window is even is 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 uh, is even you know more narrow because of our challenges, and so that now is not the time to waste money on 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 pet projects. It is the time to spend the money, use the money wisely. We in the Working People's Alliance, we have said that, look, we are not in the business of criticizing the government on oil for the sake of criticizing. We are trying to be as constructive as we can when it comes to the oil industry. So you take something like, you know, the recent raising of the debt ceiling. Our position, as Professor Thomas articulated it, is that we are not against the government raising the debt ceiling in, 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 in principle, as governments all around the world borrow. So we are not critical of the government for borrowing against the wealth that is projected to come. What we are critical of the government 
for is having borrowed the money, what you're spending it on. If you're going to borrow the money and then you're going to spend it on subsidies, we are totally against that. If you're going to spend it on uh, projects that are not sustainable, we are against that. If you're going to spend it on projects that do not lead the country to be consistent with the United Nations Sustainable Development Agenda, we are against that. So we in the WPA, we are saying, look, we are not you're going to criticize everything the government does, even if it makes sense. But this government is, is, is its own worst enemy. That even if it does something right in principle, it messes it up by the way it manages it, the way it governs. Why are you 50 cents for producing sugar? And the world price is half that. I mean, even if it were to bring you a couple of votes, are you trying to tell us that if you make sugar right, that sugar workers are going to stop voting for you? We don't think so. And so therefore it should not be a choice of sustaining an, an unsustainable industry and political survival we should have to make that choice but that is what the ppp is doing and that is our major concern that is our major concern in the working people's alliance that this government is not meeting its global its international obligations And so we are warning Guyana. We are warning Guyana that we have to keep an, an eye, well, more than an eye, we have to keep two eyes on what this government is doing. Even when it is making the right moves, it is the outcome of those right moves that we have to be careful about. And so in this series of programs that we are doing with uh, Professor Clive Thomas here, is to really bring that perspective on our discourse on oil and gas, our discourse on sugar, our discourse on poverty, our discourse on the environment, our discourse on development. And we are saying that as a party, we want to contribute to the discourse, but we also want to contribute to the actual building of a sustainable economy that is going to move Guyana from a post-plantation society to a society that is sustainable, a society that is viable, an economy that is viable. And if you have a viable economy, then you have a society that is going to meet all the standards of development as we move deep into the 21st century. And so we are calling on our partners, our political partners, whether it be the PPP, the PNC, and others, that we have to begin to talk about development in a new way. And if we begin to talk about development in a new way, then we are going to begin to actualize the plans for development in a new way. We are going to make different choices. But if we link our developmental plans to political and partisan survival, we are in trouble. The PPP, has said that it is governing based on its manifesto. It sounds nice because people are going to say, you promise things in your manifesto and you're delivering your manifesto. But manifestos are just that. 
Manifestos are not developmental plans. And you have to be able to monitor what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis. You have to link that monitoring of what is happening on a day-to-day -day basis with your larger vision of where you want to take the society. And we in the WPA are arguing that while poverty is not the only problem we have in Guyana, that if we were to put a dent on poverty, we are going to unleash a lot of other possibilities for development of people and ultimately development of our economy. And so there's, there is where we are. We are at a pivotal moment in our history. Our politics has, have been toxic. We have been a highly partisan society. That is not going to stop. But at least if we are forward thinking leaders in the political parties, they will find a way to balance your partisan political interests with the interests of development. We can't be calling on Europeans for reparations, which means repair. And we are calling on Europeans to repair the damage that they have inflicted on our society. And we are not willing to repair our bad ways. Our politics need repairing. Our attitude to economic development need repairing. So the same standards we are holding Europeans to, we have to hold ourselves to those standards. And that's the word from the WPA, the Working People's Alliance. Again, thank you all for staying with us. And I'll see you all tomorrow. I think tomorrow we have Nigel Hughes is going to be on tomorrow and we're going to be talking about governance. In particular, how do we deal with the question of power? Because the question of power is linked to the economy. It is linked to economic development. So until tomorrow, we say again, thanks to you for staying with us another another evening another night tomorrow night see you all one race from the same place that make the same trip on the same ship so we must push one common intention it's for a better life in the region for the woman and we children that must be the ambition of the Caribbean and the